Okay. So any question for the, the previous section? So we are done with the generalization. So we can now have a, a n functional, a functional with a multi-dependent or in, an independent variable. Now the next topic is uh, optimization with constraint. So we will skip one section because the section 22.3 is basically a review for optimization of a, of a function. So you probably know that uh, how to do that uh, with a constraint. So these are topics in maybe undergraduate, math, or even calculus, right? So you probably learn about that. I assume you learn about that, but we'll generalize the idea to the optimization with, with, of a functional. Okay, so that's what we'll do. The, Next section, 22.4. And the idea is very similar to optimization of, of a function. We'll, we'll go back to the basic form rather than a multi-dependent and independent variable. We'll go back to the, to the basic form with just one. Um, just one y so y and then y x x right so although your your book uh, just have a have just in the index it indicating you, you have a more than one variable that doesn't matter uh, whatever the generalization the same method will apply so now instead of just optimizing this functional. Um, now we're imposing constraint. So basically, there are two kinds of constraint. So one is uh, just that those uh, the function y and y x and x might satisfy a relationship. So in your textbook, that uh, like you have a function of y y sub x and x, right? That equals to zero. There might be more than one of them. So you get the index to indicate there are more than one constraint, this kind of constraint. So basically it's a functional relationship between y and y, y x and x. So basically these are differential equation that y has to satisfy. So um, it doesn't, doesn't matter what those are. So it's, uh, we're just presenting the general formulation. So this is the first kind. The second kind is that, uh, so this is one, and then the second kind is instead of uh, a function, function that uh, depends on y, y sub x and x, you might have another integral uh, but, uh, let's see. Uh, look at the language of, yeah. Instead of that one, you might have a, something like, uh, this would be, becomes an integram. And over the same uh, integral of, of x, this interval, this interval equals to some kind of a constant. Okay, instead of a, a function, we put that function in an integral. So this itself is an integral. Okay, so that's uh, the other kind of constraint. All right, so now to impose the Lagrange, Lagrange multiplier for the two cases, 
So uh, the only difference is that the Lagrange multiplier for the first case will be a function of x also. But the, the Lagrange multiplier for the second case is just constant. Okay, so this means that, uh, let's see, um, language of, maybe it's basically, you know, you, you need to vary. Vary the original function j, this way, like this. If oh, x, x. and then my uh, plus or minus the Lagrange multiplier. So plus mm. now for each k, you have a Lagrange multiplier k. And then uh, that depends on x for the first first kind. And then you put this put this in here. Okay. So the variation becomes varying this equals to zero. Okay. So the branch multiplier inside that and the constraint go into the integral this way. Okay. And for the second kind, uh, the only difference is that the lambda becomes a just constant because this is itself an integral. So the variation is uh, yeah. This lambda k can get out, mm. I should say, mm. I should add the sum of the k, sum of the k. Lambda k can get out of the integral. Mm. K. Okay. <laughs> So the two form two formulation the only difference is that uh, this one has a kx dependence in the Lagrange multiplier then the second one doesn't have that okay so that's uh, the only difference and once you have uh, put the Lagrange multiplier in your functional that you want to vary. Then the rest is just following this, this, the unconstrained problem. You just write down the Euler Lagrange equation based on this functional, the new functional with, with the Lagrange multiplier. And after you solve that, you might or may not need to solve for the Lagrange multiplier. Depends on the situation. Okay. That. Uh, So that's how, how it goes. Is there any question? Just, just, just the first, first simple generalization like the function, optimization of function, this kind of idea. And your textbook has then uh, presented uh, some examples. A few examples, some are just, uh, optimization problem and some are just formulating equation like in quantum mechanics um, that sort of thing okay so that is to illustrate this kind of uh, formulation but uh, I probably won't go into those I, instead of, I work out a, a homework problem, I mean the end of chapter question. So that, uh, so that uh, as an illustration, let's look at here it is. Uh, 
I think it's a 22.4.3. Okay. Ooh, who worked that out? Okay, so. Uh, that one is uh, not difficult. It's, it's an illustration of the second case. So the second case obviously is uh, easier because uh, the Lagrange multiply uh, is just a constant and it's just uh, one variable, one dependent variable and one independent variable. So 22.4.3 basically is uh, the, the question itself is uh, doesn't have numerical uh, specification. Basically, you're saying that there are there's a, uh, a cable, flexible cable that is important. It need to be flexible. I mean that means that uh, uh, sorry. You have, let's introduce them. The coordinate your x here, y here. So you have two points. You like x one and Okay, this is y1, and then and then another point, x2, and y2. Now these are the two, two points that uh, you use to fix a cable, flexible cable, which means the cable is, there's no other force other than, uh, than gravity. And there's no elasticity, so it's not elastic. So the the cable doesn't deform. So if it is original of a length L, then uh, under gravity, it will not set the cable to a different length. So that is uh, the the idea. Obviously, if you want to hang a cable between these two points, then the length of this cable must be longer than the straight line distance between the two, obviously, right? So you assume you have a length, the cable length L. And I think it's also specified that this, uh, uniform mass. The question doesn't have that with a string. You need to specify that the, uh, the the uh, the cable or the rope is uh, of uniform mass density, so of different length. So whatever the mass over a certain length ds, the mass will be the same. So mass will be a constant. So if you have mass density rho times ds will be the dm will be. Uh, that the mass of this little section, okay? So that's the assumption because uh, if you don't have that, uh, then the obvious that the problem becomes uh, more complicated. Now, uh, the idea is that uh, the shape of this curve, which will indicate as y as a function x, okay? And so this curve, uh, we need to, uh, to to minimize the potential energy. So you have a uh, gravity, so you have gravity G and assume to be uniform, right? So, uh, so you want to minimize the total gravitation energy. Now the gravitation energy, right? Uh, whatever that energy, would be uh, dm times g times the location, the y location, so mgh, right? And uh, of course, uh, the absolute value is important because you can always move the total potential energy at it with a constant. So you want to minimize m or, or actually should be Rho G D N, right? So that is the no, the, this there's a Y here, Y D N. 
Okay, so that is the potential energy. Now, dm is, I actually see gy dm, because uh, rho ds is, is introducing by this uh, uniform density assumption. So that is, uh, and g is a constant, rho is a constant, so rho g and y ds. And ds we already saw uh, many times. If you introduce it as a good integration along x, that would be one plus uh, dy dx squared, so y, x, y sub x squared, dx. And integrating from x sub one to x sub two. Okay, so this is, this is the energy, potential energy that you want to minimize. Okay. Now, this is a constraint problem because not all Y is allowed. So, because the, the length of the cable is fixed, you cannot deform it so that the length is clearly much long, much larger than the original length or much smaller than it. So that is not allowed. But even with a constraint uh, length, obviously you can still deform it subject to the same length, right? So the, whatever the shape still need to be obtained, just the length is not enough to fix the shape. Okay, but, what, but you still need to impose the length, the constraint of a length. So a constraint is L. Now it's just ds, L is x1, x2 ds, which is, one plus y x square. Okay, so that is a, a constraint. So this is the second case because the constraint is in itself a in an integral. Okay, so uh, if you want to minimize this subject to this, so the the idea is to add the two with uh, multiply this with a uh, Lagrange multiplier, okay? And we can always multiply the Lagrange multiplier with, with a constant. So we, these are just, just constant. So that doesn't matter. We can always take that out and include that in the definition of the Lagrange multiplier. So the, what we want to minimize is the J now is going to be, you have this uh, y times uh, this one, square root of this one. But then uh, you plus a Lagrange multiplier times exactly the same thing. And now the Lagrange multiplier is just a constant. Okay, so lambda is just a constant. All right, so now, once you introduce lambda, this becomes an unconstrained problem. So you just solve it like what uh, you used to be, okay? And the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation is, uh, you can use the form that, uh, because uh, the integral doesn't depend on x. So you have a, 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 another form of, um, of the Lagrange multiplier, I mean the Euler Lagrange equation that is uh, in section one. We talk about that. Uh, we can look that back up. That uh, is in equation 20, 2.21. Okay. So it's uh, the integram F. If you call it the integram F, then F minus Y sub Y times F minus Y sub X. X equals the constant. So that's the form of the Euler Lagrange equation. All right, so now we just uh, substitute F to say this is our F. Okay, so now you just plug this in here. So you have Y plus 
lambda plus y x square and then minus y x and take the derivative over this f. Now the factor in front doesn't depend on y sub x. So you just copy that y plus lambda. Okay. And then uh, you take the derivative over this. So you have, uh, we did that before. So it's just it's one half and one plus y x squared in the denominator and then two y sub x and tensor the two, you get y sub x. So this is this one. So this is this one. Okay. Now you can get the common denominator. And then this factor, you get out of this uh, equation. So you have one plus y x square. This is one plus y x square. And minus, this is y x times y sub x, y x square. Right, so this two cancel. And that equals to a constant. Now we can, uh, let's see what the, what, It's equals a constant. Let, let's just uh, call it constant first because we wanted to introduce a constant that is uh, maybe a little um, uh, more convenient in the mathematical form. So, right. So, uh, okay. So, did I get everything right? All right. Okay, so now to solve this, you multiply this to the other side. Right, and so y plus lambda equals to the constant um, so square root of one plus y x square. Okay, and now the, we have seen this before. If you remember, we solved solve the Zub free, uh, film problem. We have exactly the same equation, to, except this, this uh, Lagrange multiplier. But that turns out to be a major difference. But the form is uh, very similar, okay? It's just that uh, introduce this this one. So the you, if you remember that uh, the subframe problem, we solve it like uh, the end up you get the hyperbolic cosine or cos function. Okay. So and the reason using that is that uh, if you choose it appropriately, this y x a hyperbolic cosine cos in the derivative will give you sinh and sinh square plus one will give you cos, right? And then the, the cos function, uh, cos square, I take a square will give you cos and y, y plus, now y plus lambda will give you a cos function. Okay, so we can, uh, knowing this, we can, instead of solving it, you can solve it, I mean, this equation allows you to solve y x as a function of y, and then you use the simple uh, integration to solve for y x. But uh, knowing the solution, the form of the solution, we can try. So y plus lambda is uh, hyperbolic, of course, the sine function so is cos. Okay. And now, uh, we remember uh, the uh, so frame problem, you have x and c sub one, and you need to multiply by the same c sub one over here. So that uh, one plus y x square will give you a cos. 
Okay, so we try this one. Okay, so C sub one is a constant. Okay, now we take the derivative one sub x. Lambda is a constant. Now I take the derivative of this one. This will give you sinh, and then multiply the derivative of that, which is uh, one over C sub one. We cancel C sub one, so that will give you sinh. Let's see the C sub one. Okay, now one plus x squared will give you one plus sinh squared, which is cos squared. Okay, now I take the square root. Taking the square root of that will give you cos, which gives you here. So this constant in front should be what we call the C sub one. So this constant is C sub one. Okay. So this will be a solution of this one. Okay. You see that? So this is this one. You take the square root, we give you cos, right? And then multiply C sub one, we give this one. Okay. <laughs> you can, can, you, can you accept this solution? Is it? Is it clear to everyone? This would be a solution. This is very similar to the uh, the supreme solution, except uh, we will mention the difference, which is important. Okay. All right. So now we have this one. And then we need to solve for. C sub one, because C sub one is an unknown constant. And to solve for C sub one, you need to impose the your, uh, condition. That is the two ends of the table. Uh, the, if you substitute the two ends must satisfy the same equation. So you have two conditions. Okay. So you have two conditions, and then you have a uh, unknown is C sub one and lambda. Supposedly that will allow you to solve, solve for the two unknowns. Let's see if we can you know, solve for that. Let's just write it down. So, so this is just to show that this is a solution. Just plug that in, you can satisfy yourself this is a solution. Now we substitute the two conditions. So you have y sub one plus lambda equals to C sub one. Uh, cosh C sub one. That's the first condition. The second condition is the same. Y sub two plus lambda equals to C sub two. Cosh sub two over C. Okay. Now, uh, we still have one condition here, the, the, the length of, this will give you a, uh, this will give you another constraint. So we use this one, substitute this into here. So that would be a cos square and then square would be cos and the cos taking the derivative dx will give you sinh. Let, let's write it down, or, or maybe I'll, I'll write it down over here. So maybe a little bit over here. C sub one. There's only, there's only one one const, constant that you not need to solve. The coefficient only depends on one constant. There's no. <laughs> I I write wrong here. So C sub one. So sorry. All right. So now uh, let's get the constraint first. So L is equals to x1, x2. And now I substitute this into here. So that gives you a cosh, just this one, cos of x over c sub one dx. Now the integ integration of Cos again will give you sinh. That will give you sinh. 
But then uh, you need to multiply by C sub one because uh, there's, you know, there's a C sub one in the function. Okay. So uh, that evaluate from X one to X two. So basically you subtract the two. Okay, so that's that's L. So, you, so C sub one need to satisfy this this uh, this equation also. Okay. Now to get an equation for C sub one, uh, what you can do is uh, cancel this uh, lambda because you don't want to carry the lambda around in order to solve the C sub one. So one thing you can do is subtract the two. So Y two minus Y one is C sub one. Gosh. It's two C sub one minus cos x one over C sub one. Okay. Now, what we will do is uh, uh, I mean, this looks like a, a, a trick. But uh, we want to get a simpler relationship relationship between these function, and the relationship will be like uh, because they they have the same form. You have sinh cos here, sinh here, cos here, but they are the first term is related to x sub two, the second term related to x sub one. And we know that cos square minus sin square is just one. So if we take the square of this and then minus the square of that, supposedly we have some cancellation. Okay, so let's do that. We have y2 minus y1 square minus L square minus the square of that. So what do you have? Uh, you have C sub one square. Okay. And your cos square of this one minus sin square of this one will give you one, right? Because if you take a square, you have square of this and then plus square of this, and then minus the square of this, the whole thing, you have square of this and then the plus the square of this and you subtract the two. Each one you get give you one, so you have two of them. Okay, and the rest is uh, this is minus two cos x two over c one cos x one over c one and minus this one minus c x two over c one. Sinh x1 over c1. Okay. We got it. So, so square up this minus square up that. Now you can simplify this one. Using the a hey, hey, relationship between cos function and sinh function, this is look like the cosine formula, right? Cosine a plus cosine cosine a cosine b minus sine a sine b. This is instead of just uh, instead of that is you have a cos, and what you end up with should be just cos. Uh, a minus b because uh, when when both of them when x one equals x two then this some cos square minus sin square should give you one 
So that should give you a co cos of x2 minus x1, which is zero, and then that should give you one. Okay, so that is c1 square. We have two minus two cos x2 minus x1 over c sub one. Okay. Now this one, you can further simplify that. Okay, this is look like a a cos two two theta a cosine two theta formula. Looks like that one. You can uh, try to simplify that. Let's find a space to simplify that. So I see we are, we are done with all this. Okay. Yes. Which are all that? Just consider this one, and just just consider this. Uh, just a const, just a constant argument like two minus two cos of a variable like whatever, like z, because we don't have c here, so there's no confusion. So that equals to two minus e to the z minus or plus e to the minus z. We'll just use the definition of the cost function. And looks, that looks like a uh, square of e to the z over two minus e to the minus z over two square uh, or minus of that, because the square of that will give you e z, the square of that will be e minus z, and this minus this times that times two will give you a cost term, and that uh, this cancel with that, so that gives you just minus two and the minus minus is two. And this is uh, the factor in front is the cinch, uh, two cinch. So minus four cinch z over two. Right? Is that okay? So just I mean you can look up the math table and math handbook and find that one. Okay. So okay, so <laughs> it's this uh this uh trigonometric or hyperbolic formula. Okay, so that is equals to minus four c sub one square c. Wait. This is this one, right? So minus four, yeah. C square, I forgot. This is square. C square of x two minus x1 over two c sub one. Okay. This is a long analysis, but uh, you, you just need to go through that. Okay, so now you get the equation just for c sub one, just for c sub one. This one equals to this for me, because we have a little bit more analysis to do. We can solve for L square here. So L square equals to put it on to the other side, put that back to here. We get Y2 minus Y1 square plus four C1 square cinch of square of X2 C sub one. So that is an equation. So that you, you need to solve for C sub one based on this equation. Because every other, uh, every variable, every other parameters here is just uh, different. So y2, y1, x2, x1 are the coordinates. So those are fixed. L is fixed, is the length of the cable. Okay. Now you need to solve for C sub one, but then, uh, 
you realize that it's not all always possible to solve for C sub one. There's a constraint. There's a, there's a condition for a solution because uh, this is square, this is square term, this is square term. Obviously it's greater than, over greater than zero. It's not greater than zero because this is a sinh function. Sinh function is, uh, put it inside the floor. The sinh function is something like that, right? And sinh function is always greater than a linear function of the, when the argument is small, right? When argument is small, that give you just a straight line. The second term gives you a straight line. This is a sinh, this is a straight line, but the sinh is always greater than the straight line, right? So this is always greater than y2 minus y1 square. And the straight line of that will be x2 minus x1 divided by, but oh, there's a two here. You write a two C1, so that's straight line, but they square up that. So X2 minus X1 squared divided by four C1 squared cancel with this. It's a two minus X1 squared. Okay. So this, the solution, the condition for solution is just basically saying that the length the L, the length of the table must be greater than the distance between the two fixed points, which is reasonable. If it's shorter than that, you cannot connect these two points. So there, there will be no solution. Is that okay? So, so the analysis shows finally you, you get this condition. Okay. Now the, the question is, if this condition is satisfied, the, the cable is longer than the distance between the two points, do we always have a solution or how many solutions we have? Okay. Now you, then you look for the, the property of the sinh function, right? If L is greater than that, you know that L will be like this when C sub one is, because it is a small, when C sub one goes to infinity, this will go to here, right? And so this is basically a small, uh, uh, the property of a small value of C sub one. Now, if L is larger than this one, so you need this to increase, but the sinh function always increases without reducing C sub one. And if L, you can consider just take the limit. If L is very, very large, then can you find a C sub one so that the whatever large number you will find a C sub one to match this? The answer is yes, because uh, in the limit of L goes to infinity, you can always choose C sub one goes to zero. When C sub one goes to zero, the sinh function is exponentially large. And even if you multiply by a small parameter, it's still large. So you can always find a C sub one to match this condition. Graphically is that uh, when L is large, there's this condition, is matching a condition. You move this to the other side and divide the C sub one over here. So graphically, this is a sinh function and move that to here divided by here and then take the square root. This is, a, this is also a line. And it means that the solution is basically finding an intersection of the sinh function to a straight line. And as long as the slope is greater than the slope of this function, the linear uh, limit for, for small argument, then you always have an intersection because the sinh function curve around curves, curve up exponentially. So you always hit, always have a uh, intersection and always have only one intersection, right? Because you intersect, once you intersect that, this is going, the sinh function will go faster than the linear function. You will not intersect it again, but you always have one solution, okay? It means that if this condition is satisfied, you can always find a C sub one that solve this uh, equation. And once you have to solve C sub one, 
then you can put in either these two condition to solve for to solve for the unknown uh, Lagrange multiplier lambda. Okay, then that would be a whole solution. Is that okay? So the analysis is uh, kind of complicated, but it's, it's a long analysis. But uh, just to show that as long as you are reasonable, the, you're connecting a table or a world between the two points that the, the length of this world is greater than the distance between the two points, you can always find a shape of the, this, the, the string that uh, corresponds to the minimum energy, minimum potential energy. Okay. And the string, the mathematical description of this string would be this hyperbolic cosine function. Okay. And there's a name for this, for this curve. This kind of curve is called the uh, cardinary, right? Cardinary. You learned about this thing before, right? So, all right. So, and then the form is special. So it's a, of this form. Now remember that the, the, for the Zoff frame problem, it's different. The condition to solve for the Zoff frame, remember this is when you have a two ring, okay? And this is wherever this x1, I mean, x1 location and this distance, the ring is of radius one. And the corresponding condition is to solve as one equals to C1 cross X1 over, over C sub one. Oh. I think it's this one, it's this one. But anyway, uh, this is X1, right? Yeah, I guess it is X1. So well, given x1, you need to solve for c sub one, right? And what we did or analyzed before is that when the distance is small, there's two possibility, the two solution, one is shallow, the other is deep, right? But if x1 is larger than a certain value, then you will not have a solution. So that is different from the, this cardinal problem because uh, you always have a solution provided that you satisfy the constraint. The constraint that length is greater than the distance between the two points. Then you always have a solution, but not for the frame problem. You pull it further apart, too far apart, and you have no solution. Okay, that's because of this uh, difference. Other solution is of the same form. The constraint imposed that uh, is different. So for this one, you can always find a solution, but that one, you cannot. And so that is the, the different, or, and, and then the cardinal, the, the shape of y uh, is, is the cost function up to a vertical displacement. So you can all, always have an offset based on the, uh, the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so that is the analysis. Any question about the analysis? <laughs> okay. Now the so we have this is an illustration for the uh, mathematics, but then uh, I, I think finally to close up the semester, I would like to do a demonstration. It's, it's kind of unlikely that uh, a grad course would have a demonstration. So, but I make some. Uh, demonstration for this cardinal problem because uh, although this course is mathematical physics, uh, it's basically the math part, but uh, we need to acknowledge that uh, physics is based on two kind of equally important pillars. One is mathematics, the other is experiment. So you cannot forget one and just concentrate the other. So mathematics is important. Otherwise you describe everything qualitatively, you just hand waving everything and you can't, can't be specific of anything. But still after you do all the mathematics, you, you need to check with experiment, experimental results. Although I'm not an experimentalist, 
as far from experiment I do see, but uh, we can check that uh, this analysis. We're saying that uh, we hang a, a rope or a, or a string or something like that, then the shape will be a hyperbolic cosine. Now I print out the hyperbolic cosine function that two side. So this is the blue curve, there's the hyperbolic cosine. There's a red curve that corresponds to the, the sinh function hyperbolic sine. We'll talk about how, what is this one because uh, this, the L function is basically a sinh function. You remember this is, if you set the, if you set X, X2 is this uh, opposite of X1. So like if this is the minus X2, X2 that becomes just a sinh function. So uh, now we can test uh, whether you hang a rope or something like that, that will be following this uh, the cost function. I have another one that is basically larger than enlarging the, the lower part. The important thing about making this graph of this graph is that uh, you need to make sure that uh, the aspect ratio after you print it out, you use whatever graphic program. For me, I just use Excel to plot it. But after you plot it and print it, sometimes the printer doesn't, sometimes the printer will distort the horizontal and vertical scales. But you need to make sure that after you print out the square, so it's like a one by one square, is of equal length. That is this cardinally. This the scale of X and Y must be the same. Otherwise you will distort the, the shape and then you, you will not, then, then the, the experiment will have some error. Then, and, uh, so after I print out, I just use a ruler to measure the square. It turns out to be okay. So just close to within a millimeter, that kind of thing. Okay, now the test is uh, you need to be a little careful. If you use a string, a common string, you want a string that is not too elastic. Most strings have some elasticity that is unavoidable and it's flexible enough. It's not just kink and then whatever is a thick in shape that won't work, right? So, and if you test this, uh, deep curve first using a string and whatever you do is just uh, fix one point and then try to hang it. You can go over it, doesn't matter. You can see if you can make the string go through the, the hyperbolic cosine function. Fix one point and adjust the, the other location. I mean, it's not exactly the same. It's kind of wider than the blue curve. Can you see that? kind of wider than the blue curve. No matter how you adjust it, it doesn't go totally overlapping. And the reason is that the, this curve is too curved or the curvature is too large. For most string, it doesn't like a large curvature or a small radius of curvature because like the, the test is that you put it together. Suppose if a catenary, you go straight down, right? The pattern resolution must be going straight down. Going straight down meaning the going straight down meaning going the the, the uh, lower part will have a very large curvature or small radius of curvature. And most string doesn't like that. It has some elasticity to rep repose it. It doesn't allow you to go all the way. It doesn't like a, a very sharp kink. Like okay, so. So that test over this, you put it just like a usual letter size paper that doesn't work that well. So you, but if you enlarge it, it's just, just the lower part so that the curvature is smaller and then you can test it again. So fix one side and then uh, going the other side and Make sure that you're, you're, you're not touching the papers so and just minimize the friction. Then you see that it's much better. You actually can overlap the, the blue curve much better. So that is to test with a string. And the idea of, uh, to remove this uh, problem of, uh, of elasticity is try to uh, 
minimize uh, them in not having a large uh, curvature. You can use a, a, a chain of that. A chain actually works much better because uh, there's not much elasticity. You get it close to each other, basically vertical, go vertical, right? So we can now test it with it here, the same. I'm almost out of turn, but uh, let's try it. Like this one work for the large one, for the, for the large size curve, this works pretty good. And you can test it with the deeper curve. So fix one in. Now you try it. I mean, the, the board may not be totally vertical, but you adjust, try to adjust. See if you get the two overlapping and it's much better, much better than this. Thing. Because of just because of this uh, curvature problem, a, a, a chain doesn't have this elasticity. It try, doesn't try to expose you, but although that it's not exactly uniform mass density because of this ring structure, but the non-uniformity scale is uh, much smaller than, length scale is much smaller than the total length of the, the, the string. So that doesn't matter that much. So you actually get to uh, uh, much uh, better, uh, much better uh, agreement. Although, uh, I mean, I'm not being quantitative, it's just overall looks a better agreement. Now the, the sine curve, we can also test it. Just uh, bear with me another, another minute. Like uh, what we try to do, but this one you, you need to actually pin it in because I don't have three hands. So I need to pin that one on one side. So pin one end on the on the one side of the cos function, and then I try to make it match to the total length. Adjust it a little bit so that it's a pretty good match here. Okay, so what I do is uh, find out the length scale from the bottom, the lowest part, which is this uh, x equal to zero part. Just get this point, unpin it. So now you have the total length, right? Then you measure whether the total length is agree, agreeing with the sinh function. You see that the wet curve is a sinh function. If I fix it on this end and not pulling it up too much, you see that the uh, agree with the sinh function. All right, so, so this is, uh, of course it's, it should be because this for mathematics, you integrate a cos function of this form then the length will give you the sin function. Okay, so it kind of agree, oh, although I'm not being quantitative here, but I mean, someone if you are interesting, they, they test it, uh, design an experiment to actually test it and measure the difference between the two. But anyway, it's uh, good to test your math with uh, reality. <laughs> okay, any more questions? All right, so uh, that's the end of the semester. Thank you for attending this class. <laughs> all right, all right, see you all later. Bye.